Welcome once again to Free Associations for the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as my dog is by the cone that we just had to put around his head. So my dog had to have uh, surgery, uh, minor surgery, no big deal, but uh, they had to, you know, like he bites at the wound, so we had to put the cone on him today. And he, it didn't take him too long to get used to it. However, I mean, when I say get used to it, he, it didn't take him too long to accept that it was there. However, he cannot get around the house without bumping into every single wall or anything that there is. So poor guy is on his own. With the cone of shame. With the cone of shame. And I feel terrible about it. So I am hopeful that... If he's listening right now, he knows that I understand. Uh, so as you um, can guess, I am Matt Fox from the Department of Global Health here at the Boston University School of Public Health Department of Global Health and Epidemiology. And I am here for the first time ever with only one other guest host. So we can only get one, not guest host, one other host. And that is Jennifer Ryder. Hi. Now... A bit of news for those who are listening to the podcast. So Chris is just away this week, so we just missed him um, and couldn't schedule a time to get him into the studio, so he'll be back next week. However, we do have an official change in hosting duties. Don has stepped away from the podcast for a bit. Um, He is, well, probably more than a bit. Um, And Jen has agreed to take over and step in. So how do you feel about being the official... Uh, I don't know whether you're the second or the third host of Free Associations. I am thrilled. This is my lifelong dream. So thank you. I didn't, I mean, I've always assumed that for most people, it's their lifelong dream to host a public health themed podcast, but you know, you never know. So I just wanted to make sure before we went too far. Some kids want to be firefighters or vets, but. Do they, do you know, do they make uh, little kids dolls, you know, themed uh in public health podcast hosts yet it's like the it was the hottest halloween costume this year i kind of thought it would be anyway a quick reminder as always to go to the population health exchange website that is bu's hub for lifelong learning and also don't forget to go and give us a rating on itunes stitcher whatever the kids use for their podcast these days. I don't really know. Uh, But give us a rating that really helps other people find us and helps us feel good about ourselves. So now on to the show. So we have a one that we are particularly excited about that Jen and I are going to discuss. Um, So in our first segment, which is the Journal Club, we are going to talk about a study, and I put study in quotes, study of whether red meat is in fact bad for us. Now, this is one that people will probably have heard about in the news uh, a bit ago because this didn't just come out immediately. It was several weeks ago that this was big in the news, but I'm actually glad we waited a little bit because more information kind of came out on this one. Then in the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we are going to talk about creating a kinder research culture. Although I will say there's a chance we don't actually get to that depending on how much we have to say because this is a, a really juicy one for the first one. So we'll see how how much we have to say on the second one. Meaty. M- meaty. I would say this is a bit of red meat for the public health crowd. Would you say that? And then in our amazing and amusing, Jen will tell us uh, some late breaking news on avocado pricing, I assume. Not again. You don't have any updates on, no, the, on no, the price no of avocados? Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get into segment one. So the article that we're going to talk about is on the health effects of eating red meat. It was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and the study was entitled Unprocessed Red Meat and Processed Meat Consumption, Dietary Guideline Recommendations from the Nutrarex Consortium. The first author on this was Bradley Johnston of the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology at uh, Dalwies? Sounds about right. Yeah. Da- Dalhousie? <laughs> no, Dal- Dalwi, Dalhous, Dalh- D-A-L-H-O-U-S-I-E University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, up in the great 51st state of Canada. Sorry to our Canadian listeners who probably hate me saying that. Okay, so this article got a lot of attention. This You probably heard about this. Your 
parents probably heard about this and are asking you whether or not they can now eat red meat again. Um, so I looked it up. This article, if you go to the altmetric scoring, which I know you're a... You're a I love the altmetric. For reasons that you're going to tell us. Perhaps. I think I've already talked about that. You may have, but th- that was a very long time ago okay. and our listeners okay. will have forgotten. Okay. But anyway, I looked up the altmetric score and this was... At the time that I looked at it, and I know they can continue to grow over time, but at the time I looked at it, which is probably a week ago, it was 3,577. Now, to put that in context, President Obama's JAMA article, which was uh, on United States healthcare reform, progress to date, and next steps, got a score of 8,063. So we're not in that ballpark yet. Okay. But your article? You know, I haven't looked... Recently, but it's definitely under 2,000. Okay, so this is a little bit above that. Yeah. All right. But I will note that the number six article in 2016 got a score of 3,753, and that was an article about Zika. So we're roughly in the top six articles, at least of 2016, so we'll see where this pans out. But this was a, this was a big one, and I know Jen and I both have a ton of to say about this one. So I do want to make the warning now that the second segment might get cut short, might get cut out completely depending on how long we want to we want to go on about this. Um, but let me give you some, some headlines on this one. And I, I kept a bunch in here and there is a reason for that because I thought they kind of spoke to different things. So BBC News says, is meat really that bad for you? Question mark. Uh, Yahoo News says, should you keep eating red meat? controversial study says well-known health risks are just bad science. Whole lot in that title. Uh, Is eating beef healthy? The new fight raging in nutrition science explains, says Vox.com. Forbes says the new guidelines to continue eating red and processed meat are dangerous and irresponsible. And so the reason why I'm highlighting these is that even in the headlines, there was actually differing opinions on how to cover this particular story. Uh, USA Today says red meat study, known health risks unfounded. Doctors decry guidelines. (laughs) So I'm not sure what that even means because which guidelines are we talking about? Are we talking about doctors? Yeah. Which? Yeah. Um, Then I'm going to give a highlight from the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, I assume. Uh, Hamilton professor calls criticism of his red meat study, quote, hysterical and, quote, extreme. And last one from the New York Times, scientist who discredited meat guidelines didn't report fast food industry ties, which I think (laughs) gets into a little bit of what we're going to talk about here. But so, Jen, you are our resident expert on getting us up to speed on these studies. So tell us what this study was all about and what they did and what they found. Sure. So I just wanted to start by providing some context in what the current meat guidelines are. Oh, good, because I'm not sure I know this. Okay. So, you know, of course, there are several different agencies that that um, offer guidelines. So the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines for Americans suggests limiting red meat, including processed meat, to one weekly serving. How are you doing? What now? One weekly serving of red or processed meat. Or, not and. Or. So I'm supposed to have one serving of bacon a week? That's correct. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I got some homework to do. Public Health England, they suggest limiting intake of red or processed meat to 70 grams per day. I I can't do grams. What's that? A Um, a pound? I actually... (laughs) No, it's not. (laughs) It's not even close. (laughs) You wish. You I wish. do. But I thought the I thought the, the English kind of think of bacon as a condiment. <laughs> the um again, remember these are recommendations. Uh the World Cancer Research Fund, American Institute for Cancer Research, suggests moderate amounts of red meat and very little processed mm-hmm. meat, so mm-hmm. a little less okay. quantitative. Yep. IARC, there was a working group on um, red and processed meat intake. Can you just say what IARC is? Because I think most some people know that, but not everyone. Sure. So it's the International Agency for Research on Cancer, um, and it's part of the the WHO. And, and and they make they make most of the recommendations around what is considered to be carcinogenic. They do, but one just important caveat is that, that they convene independent working groups for each yep. of those issues. So it's not IARC itself, but panelists who are. Um, invited to participate. Fair enough. Got it. So their recommend 
they determined based on their evaluation that red meat um, is probably carcinogenic, which is that is a specific classification that they have, and, probably. And, and red meat specifically, not not just processed meat, but so red they meat. looked at processed meat separately, okay. and they found that processed that. meat was carcinogenic. So oh, got it. So a stronger recommendation. What uh, do you know? What the categories are for uh, IARC? So there's possibly, probably, and carcinogenic, and then there's you know no evidence. Got it. So. So that's sort of where we stand right now in terms of the recommendations. But the authors felt that the recommendations have primarily and primarily been based on observational studies, and therefore there was a lot of potential for confounding. They also noted that many of the studies that have been published in this area have not reported absolute magnitude of the effects. So they all reported relative risk estimates, but you don't get a sense of the the absolute mm-hmm. risk. Mm-hmm. A problem, I agree. They also thought that the recommending agencies had not conducted or accessed rigorous systematic reviews of the mm-hmm. evidence. Mm-hmm. They felt that the prior publications have been limited in addressing conflicts of interest, which is interesting given some of what we'll discuss later. And another very interesting aspect of this paper is the emphasis on values and preferences regarding meat consumption. Mm -hmm. Um, And they say that prior work has not addressed that. And values and preferences meaning that we should care about whether or not people really like red meat and therefore that should influence our that the the recommendations? Recommend, yes. I mean, that's what these authors are claiming, that recommendation should not only be based on the association between your exposure and your outcome, but also how willing people are to change. But people really like smoking, and smoking is addictive. I, I mean, there There's a lot oof. to talk about. Okay. Okay. So in response to all of those shortcomings that the authors uh, viewed in prior studies, they formed the Nutritional Recommendations International Consortium, which they abbreviate to Nutrirex. And the recommendations in this particular paper are based on five different systematic reviews that are published in the same issue of Annals of Internal Medicine. So four of those systematic reviews focused on randomized control trials and observational studies of unprocessed red meat and processed meat consumption on cardiometabolic and cancer outcomes. Mm -hmm. The final systematic review focused on personal health-related values and preferences regarding meat consumption. Okay. Okay, so in putting together these recommendations, they form Nutrirex formed uh, three different teams. They had a leadership team, a guideline panel, and then a literature review team. The guideline panel included a number of health experts. So they had um, experts in health research methods, nutritional epi, dietetics, basic and translational research, family medicine, and also general internal medicine. Uh, It also included three members from outside the medical and health community. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I mentioned was that they were very concerned about potential conflicts of interest. So their process... Were they? (laughs) Their... I'm really trying to be objective here, Matt. Uh, Of course. Okay. Their process included inviting potential members who did not appear to have any perceived conflicts of interest to, within the last three years at least, uh, to participate in the the panel. People who responded and were interested uh, then had to report much more detailed information on any potential conflicts, and only individuals without conflicts were invited to be on the panel. They decided to focus exclusively on health outcomes that were thought to be associated with red or processed meat consumption and not on animal welfare or environmental issues. And maybe we can discuss that a little bit more later. Uh, But they had some outcomes that they considered critically important for the development of their recommendations. So those were things like all-cause mortality, uh, the major uh, cardiometabolic outcomes such as CVD mortality, stroke, um, myocardial infarction, and diabetes, as well as cancer incidence in mortality for GI cancers, prostate cancers, 
and gynecologic cancers. So there were a number of individual cancers that they looked at. Also in that critical category were issues of quality of life and willingness to change red or processed meat consumption. Then they had a separate category of outcomes that they considered not critically important, but just important for recommendation development. Those were things like surrogate outcomes of weight, uh, BMI, blood lipids, anemia, and also the reasons that people chose to eat red meat. So that was considered. They had um, separate recommendations for red and processed meat, and they were explicit in stating that their recommendations were really targeted at individuals who consume red or processed meat. So the quote from the article is that the focus was on individual decision-making rather than a public health perspective. Okay, makes sense. Okay, I mean, so- I don't know that it makes sense as a decision, <laughs> but it makes sense You're what they did. You're clear on what I'm they did. I'm clear on what yes. they did. Okay, so they to develop the guidelines, they used a methodology that some of the authors on this paper had previously developed and and published. It's called the GRADE methodology, stands for Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And I'm I'm just going to read the quote because I don't know how else to summarize this. So the goal is that the strength of a recommendation reflects the extent to which we can be confident that the composite desirable effects of a management strategy outweigh the composite undesirable effects. Mm -hmm. So that is the goal. They followed a systematic review protocol that was developed and also previously published by the authors. For these systematic reviews, the databases were primarily searched through July 2018, except for Medline that went through April 2019. So we are incorporating a lot of the most recent evidence. Mm -hmm. For the analyses of harms and benefits, they included randomized control trials and cohort studies that included at least a thousand adults that assessed diets of varying quantities of red or processed meat for at least six months. It didn't include studies where more than 20% of the participants were pregnant, had a prior cancer or chronic health condition other than cardiometabolic disease. The guideline panel determined that three servings a week was a realistic reduction in meat consumption. Mm -hmm. So all of their evidence is framed um, according to that contrast. And they had to have some source of information on current risks associated with, sorry, risks associated with current levels of red and processed meat consumption. So they used the Emerging Risk Factors Collaboration Study for Cardiometabolic Incidence and Mortality um, and Globocan for Cancer Outcomes. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Okay. I think. For the health-related values and preferences, they used previously published uh, qualitative studies and also quantitative cross-sectional studies that Mm -hmm. were conducted in adults. All right. So I think we're ready to move into the results. Let's give us, give us what they found or what they did or what they concluded. Cause they didn't do, I mean, they sort of did. They did do some systematic reviews. They did. Yes. That they did do. Okay. So they summarized all of those systematic reviews into just a couple of recommendations, one for unprocessed red meat and the other for processed meat. So for unprocessed red meat, they suggest that adults continue their current levels of consumption. Just keep going. Just keep going. Don't change. So 11, and that is a weak recommendation uh, based on low certainty at evidence. So that's part of this grade methodology is you, you are explicit about your the strength of your um, recommendation. So 11 of 14 panel members actually voted for that, for Mm -hmm. this weak uh, recommendation to continue consumption. Three actually voted for a weak recommendation to reduce consumption. Yep. Okay. So the results of the randomized controlled trials, that evidence was based on 54,000 participants. They found that there was little or no effect on risk for major cardiometabolic outcomes, cancer incidents, or mortality. And then there, the evidence was also based on cohort studies for cardiometabolic outcomes. The dose response uh, meta-analysis included 23 trials of 1.4 million participants, and they found that there was low to very low certainty evidence that decreasing 
unprocessed red meat intake may result in a small reduction in risk of major cardiovascular outcomes or type 2 diabetes uh, with no significant associations with all-cause mortality or cardiovascular mortality. And for cancer, which was based on uh, dose-response meta-analyses from 17 cohorts with 2.2 million participants, they again found low certainty evidence that decreasing intake may result in a very small reduction of overall lifetime cancer mortality. And as I mentioned in the beginning, one aim of this study was to provide absolute risks, which had not been included in many of the prior studies. So just for instance, for cancer, overall lifetime cancer mortality, uh, they found an absolute risk reduction of seven per 1,000 persons for a decrease of three servings per week. So when you say decrease, so if, if you dropped three servings per week, your estimated reduction in risk is... Seven out of 1,000... Seven... Cases. Cases of cancer yep. per 1,000 people over a lifetime? Yes, and this is mortality. So seven cancer oh, deaths. Oh, cancer deaths. Yes, correct. Over a lifetime? Correct. Hmm. Yeah. The other cancer outcomes that they looked at, so prostate cancer mortality, incidence of overall cancer, breast cancer, et cetera, they found no significant differences there. And then for processed meat consumption, which they also suggested that adults just continue their current consumption, 11 out of 14 panelists also voted for that week mm-hmm, recommendation mm-hmm. to continue, while again, three voted a, for a week recommendation to reduce. There weren't any art, uh, randomized control trials for them to evaluate with respect to this exposure. For cardiometabolic outcomes, the dose-response meta-analysis from 10 cohort studies with 778,000 participants showed low to very low certainty evidence that decreased intake was associated with a small reduction in risk for the major cardiometabolic outcomes. So there, the absolute risk reduction was somewhere between 1 to 12 fewer events per 1,000 people, depending, again, for three servings a week reduction, uh, depending on what the specific outcome was. For cancer outcomes, the uh, dose-response meta-analysis included 31 cohorts with 3.5 million participants. There, they found low to very low certainty evidence that decreased intake was associated with a very small absolute reduction in overall lifetime cancer mortality, prostate cancer mortality, and incidence of esophageal, colorectal cancer, and breast cancer with an absolute reduction of one to eight fewer events per 1,000 persons with a reduction of three servings per week. But there was no significant difference in in incidence or mortality for the other 12 cancer outcomes that they looked at. And then finally, the last thing they looked at were health-related values and preferences. That assessment was based on 54 different articles. 41 of those were quantitative uh, cross-sectional studies and 13 were qualitative studies. And the bottom line is that meat eaters like meat. Uh, Shocker. They think it is an essential component of a healthy diet. And finally, that they have limited skills to prepare meals that don't include meat. Limited skills. To Correct. prepare meals that don't include red meat, specifically? Red or processed meat. Correct. So, so they don't know how to, you wouldn't know how to substitute chicken or fish or an impossible burger. Got it. Got it. That was the feedback. So the certainty of evidence was low for the reasons for meat consumption. Um, yeah. And the certainty of evidence was also low for willingness to reduce meat consumption. Okay. So... It seems to me the take-home message here from the article, not necessarily the take-home message that I want to take, mm-hmm. but the take-home message from this article is just keep doing what you're doing. If you're eating red meat, go for it. If you're not eating red meat, no reason to start, but probably they... But they didn't really look at that. They don't really... Yeah. yeah they yeah. don't really have much of a recommendation there. Okay. There has been a lot of controversy about this, as you can imagine, and part of that seems to me stems from the fact that there are a lot of entrenched interests here. There is obviously the beef industry who is going to have an opinion on this. There are people who write nutrition guidelines who have an interest in this. There is people who have staked their careers on researching diet, nutrition, who have staked positions on this. So you've got a whole 
lot of interests here and those are competing. So no, there was no doubt to me that there was, this was going to be controversial once you read the headline. Then we'll talk about in a minute, there were some conflict of interest issues. Before we get to that, I am going to give you the first ever free associations quiz. You're giving me the quiz? I'm giving you the quiz. Oh, dear. Yes. Now, you are, you are, you are able to um, say you don't know okay. to any of these questions. Okay. But here, here are my questions. Okay. When you read this, were you more influenced by the observational data or the trial data? I think, well, it's, I don't think I would make a distinction based on okay. reading the paper. Okay. So no, no distinction. No for you. distinction. Yeah. Do you think that the authors were more influenced by the trial data or the observational data? Absolutely, the trial data. The trial data. Yes. Okay. Um, and I would agree with you on that one. I think that the authors were more interested, more more influenced by the trial data. And the difference between the two being that the trial data was essentially null, no difference. You know, eating three servings versus not eating three servings per week or a reduction of three servings, depending on how you want to look at it, right. had really no benefit. Whereas the observational study suggested that there was some benefit, just not a huge benefit. Correct. Okay. How many trials for the majority of these findings, how many trials were those studies, were, were the results based on? So there were only 12 trials based on 54,000 participants evaluated. Okay. All is, right. Is that the right answer? No, it is not. Oh. Are we going to come back to that Shoot. one? Were those trials trials of a diet of red meat and or processed meat? No, they were on dietary. Well, there were two. There's another aspect of the study that I didn't cover, and that was the dietary pattern part of it. Go ahead. So as a kind of sensitivity analysis, they also looked at studies uh, where red or processed meat wasn't the primary exposure of interest, but they looked at dietary patterns that contain different levels of meat. So in other words, the differences between those different diets wasn't just wasn't just the meat. There were also other differences in the dietary pattern. Mm-hmm. And they the authors hypothesized that the result, if there really was a an adverse effect of red or processed meat, that the studies that looked at those exposures specifically would show stronger associations than the studies of dietary patterns, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. since it was a less direct assessment. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Where in fact that is not what they what they found. Yeah. Yeah. Did you look at any of the the meta analyses that these were based off of? I did. So there were a bunch of them. They five. I mean they five meta analyses and they were all published together with this article. I am going to submit to you exhibit A. Okay. This is a randomized trial from the Women's Health Initiative uh-huh. published in what year was it? 2006, uh, I think. 2006, correct. What can you read the title? Low-fat dietary pattern and risk of cardiovascular disease. And can you read for me the sample size, which I have circled for you there? It's a randomized control trial of 48,835 postmenopausal women. Almost the entirety of the data. Fascinating. Yes. For these meta-analyses come from one randomized trial, trial in the Women's Health Study, which is not a trial of red meat. Yeah. It's a trial of reducing fat. Right. Which I I find mind-boggling. I mean, it's, I don't mean to imply that there were no other trials, but most of the other trials that even were – there were very few trials. And of the trials that were available, most of them were, were excluded because they didn't meet the conditions. So there, there was – I mean, this is essentially – an entire set of guidelines, because I agree with you that I think that they were much more influenced by the by the trial data than the than the observational data. But the trial data is largely based on this one trial. Yeah, and that is one, very misleading. You do not get that sense at all at in all. reading the recommendations paper. No, and I so so I mean right there, I, it immediately raises red flags to me. And again, that's a big sample size. So that's, it's nice to see it was a big sample size, but it was it, given that, that it's only one study and I'm always skeptical of, of recommendations from one study. 
and given that it is um, I, to me, and again, I'm I'm reading into things here because you know they don't exclude the observational data, but you know they they they're not primarily focused on the observational data's effects. I think in drawing their conclusions. Okay, a couple more questions. Do you think that the authors went into this with a prior? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. This is what I, I was I was trying to think about this. And and the question becomes, should you have a prior if you're on a guideline committee? Because I I mean I regularly write down my prior before I read every study. So I, I always have a prior. But I think but it might be different with a guideline panel because the I I mean you have to there's no point in going through the exercise if you already know where you're going to come out at the end. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's right. On the other hand, it's impossible not to have a some kind of prior, right? I mean, you have to have but I I I I don't know what their prior was. I know I know by reputation some of these authors who did this work and, you know, sterling reputation. So, you know, I'd like to think that they, you know, were this all kind of by the by the book, but at the same time, I don't know how you go into this without an opinion, you know, in the same way, like, how do you find a jury that's going to, you know, be completely never heard of the, you know, the Whitey Bulger story and get a, you know, I just, I don't know that you can do it. Right. But it seems like you, you need to be willing to move. Like, yes, you may have a prior, but you need to be willing to move. And I think, I mean, the interesting, when you read about this grade methodology, I think, you know, the point of that is to make the process of going from evidence to guidelines more systematic and rigorous. Uh, I think that was, that's the goal. And I don't really, you know, I didn't do further reading on, on the grade methodology, but they do, they, they have these grade evidence to decision frameworks. So this is supposed to help panelists use the evidence summaries to develop recommendations. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's part of their methodology. And that seems like a good idea to have, you know, a a structured process for this. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I agree with that. So I've been involved in two uh, processes that, that used grade. Okay. And it is my experience that Grade is never, you are always going to have weak evidence for anything that is nutritional. So anything, huh. first of all, I mean, for once you're in the world of observational studies, the evidence immediately becomes weak, huh. right? So by, I mean, you start off at weak, you might be able to get to stronger if this was a particularly good set of studies, but you're, you're generally going to be in the weak evidence area, which, you know, I mean, we're never going to have randomized trials of certain things. So the evidence by the grade standard is always going to be weak. And that was one of the issues that came up was should the, you know, should the standards that were developed for decisions around uh, drug trials Mm -hmm. be applied to things that are not drugs? And, you know, I don't know that the standard of evidence necessarily changes. On the other hand, the decisions that we need to make don't go away just because we'll never have really good randomized trials. Now, even in the case of dietary randomized trials, they don't often get put into the category of strong evidence for a number of reasons. Number one is you can't blind them. Um, the you know adherence is is often low. All kinds of reasons that that the evidence ends up getting knocked down a bit. And I don't know what the right thing to do there is, but it does strike me as problematic to be using using guidelines that were designed for at least my understanding were designed for summarizing and evidence and making decisions around drugs for things that are never going to meet the standard. So in the, in this paper, these these evidence sum- summaries were used for health effects, so the results of these prior studies, but also for values, preferences, cost, acceptability, and feasibility of a recommendation. Are those typically included in grade? I can't say. I mean, they were not involved in the process that I was mm-hmm. I was involved in, but no, those were not, I didn't have any Interaction with those. Okay. Next question. Should Annals have published this paper? No. Why not? So, well, I I think there are a number of things about the recommendations paper. So the systematic reviews, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. 
But the there are a number of things about this summary in the recommendations paper that I just I think could be misleading. And I think that's apparent from the headlines that that resulted after its publication. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you're when you're talking about recommendations, I suppose you're in the realm of science, but you know that those are going to be picked up in a way that is that's the purpose. Really I mean, these are recommendations yeah. aimed at yep. individuals. Yep. That's that's yep. the point. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. So so that is that is as far as I'm going to go for my quiz. Are you going to answer your own quiz questions? Well, did I did I have any that I didn't answer? Do you think Annals should have published? Oh, this? sorry, I didn't answer that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I was I was um, conflicted over this because so in my working through this one, I went from yeah, you know, finally they're you know saying this stuff is all <laughs> bogus and we knew this all along. And if Chris were here, he would he would of course be saying that he you know puts no stock into any nutritional study whatsoever. But I mean. Look, we have to make decisions and we have to make recommendations and the recommendations are always going to be based off of, you know, not amazing evidence for nutritional studies. I mean, we have one and only one randomized trial here that this this is based off of. I mean, not, I mean there are others, but the, the majority of the evidence. And what do we do? I mean, when is it appropriate to make recommendations when we know the evidence is not great. Because that's the thing. I mean, I don't think the evidence is great. Right. Even I mean, they admit their own recommendation is weak and based on low certainty evidence. But I completely agree with you. If that's all you have, should you be making the recommendation? I, I mean, well, I mean, so what, what, what would the alternative be? I mean, the alternative would be to say, we don't know. And, and I think there, there are other situations, you know, in cancer screening guidelines where, where that is one of the categories. There's just there's not enough evidence to make a recommendation. I think that's better than making a recommendation based on very weak evidence, particularly when the, the recommendation is just to continue doing, doing what you're doing. But in particular, when that when that recommendation goes against the current Guidelines. guidelines, like all of the guidelines, all it of appears. Them. Yes, yeah. And so it's not clear to me. On the other hand, I mean, I don't. So I, I think the evidence is overstated here. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I don't think it's completely wrong. I mean, I do think that it is fair to say that the observational evidence, at least as presented, and I, I don't want to say that I, you know, have gone through all the meta analyses and said, oh, you missed this study and right. you should have, whatever. but let's just, if we go with what's in the meta analyses that they have published, we're not talking about huge effects from these reductions. Now, maybe that's because we're talking about small reductions and we should be thinking about bigger interventions, but, you know, is it like enough that I would say it's really important that we get everybody to, to stop eating red meat? I don't I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I see what you're saying. But I do. I think that, you know, the idea, I guess for me, I'm. it's hard for me to evaluate these knowing that the authors are so focused on the individual who already consumes meat mm -hmm. because they're trying to take from population based studies something that then gets whittled down into something very personal that's based on values among only the people who are already consuming. There, there's something about that that just feels problematic to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I do know what you're saying. And I, 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 as I said to you before, I mean, we don't, we wouldn't we wouldn't make the same argument around smoking. We wouldn't say, well, people like smoking. People like it. You know, smokers like to and smoke. It's, and it's hard to change. And it's very hard to change. It's an addictive substance. So, you know, I mean, we should just let people smoke. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say that. So why we do that with something like this, I, I'm not really clear. Okay, so did we need then another recommendation? I mean, did we need this contradiction? Do we come away with anything but confusion? No. I do not think we needed another recommendation. I think the point about 
the quality of the prior studies could have been made with with through the systematic reviews potentially. I mean, I think what you pointed out with how strongly the recommendations were influenced by one single study, you know, also is another reason why there's a problem in the leap from the the actual systematic review to to the guidelines. But no, I don't think we needed another another recommendation. Yeah, and I and I agree with you there. I think that what this, I mean, right or wrong, and I I can't say I'm I'm you know at the point where I could say these people are wrong. I, I don't necessarily think that. But what I take away from what they're saying is there is actually probably some benefit to reducing red meat. It's just not a massive benefit. And given that's the case, what's the advantage to coming away with a new recommendation that says just keep doing what you're doing, which you know, again, I can understand the the lie. If this was the first recommendation to ever come out on the issue of red meat, then saying, "Look, we don't have a lot of evidence to say you should you you really should cut back. Maybe think about it, but it's you know you're not going to have major benefits." Although I will say, on a population level, if we could get everyone to stop eating red meat, there would be. But this was aimed at individuals. Matt. They took an individual. They perspective. absolutely did, which yeah. maybe was designed to do that. But given that there were there is research consensus, given that everybody already thinks we don't know what we're talking about, what's the benefit to adding a new recommendation based on weak evidence that doesn't really say much? Yeah, I completely agree. I, I also, you know, their part of the rationale for their recommendation is that they anticipated that the small reduction in risk would be insufficient to motivate people to stop eating red meat. It's like the tail wagging the dog, right? It's like, since that won't be enough for people to change, we're not going to ask them to change. Rather than just making the recommendation based on the evidence and letting people decide for themselves whether that's big enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we haven't gotten yet to this issue of not considering so let's, environmental let's issues, it. which yeah, I yeah. feel like we so, have to so do. So raise, they bring that one up because that, that was a, an interesting take. So in the limitations section of the, the paper, they say, uh, we considered issues of animal welfare and potential environmental impact to be outside the scope of our recommendations. These guidelines may therefore be of limited relevance to individuals for whom these issues are of major importance. Related to this, we took an individual rather than a societal perspective. Mm -hmm. And I did, you know, I think that the studies of that were included in these meta-analyses also didn't consider issues of of animal welfare, but they also weren't telling people just to continue consuming the way they are currently consuming. Yeah. And they were not guidelines, right? They were. were, Yes. They were individual studies. Right. Right. And so I, I'm not sure, actually, the extent to which the other guidelines considered those types of issues, you know, environmental or sustainability issues in their recommendations, if that was a consideration at all. But again, it didn't it didn't really have to be because they were telling people to limit their consumption to some some particular amount. Yeah, I find this one really, really difficult to to make a decision on because this this, you know, where do you draw the line? What what, what I mean? Do we get into ethical issues, you know, animal welfare issues? Do we get into what, what's the what's so, in so and what's out when we make the calculations? But I'm not saying yeah, no, it's just and I health, agree. But, I don't necessarily huh. believe that those issues belonged in these papers. But I think that if you were if you're considering an individual's values and preferences, yeah. you know, then you start thinking maybe maybe now we are in that domain where we should consider these these larger issues. I agree. And and if you did, you wouldn't consider the individuals, only the individuals who consume meats perspectives. You would consider the societal perspective. That's a good point. You know, because we as a society have to deal with the effects of of all the, the issues with climate that of which farming is one of them. And, you know, we have to deal with it whether or not we choose to consume or not to consume meat you would want to have a societal perspective on that that was something that they chose not to and i again i can't say that that is completely wrong but i know there are lots of people who do feel that way who feel that was a a decision that was you know just set up to confirm a belief that that you should just keep continuing doing what you're doing uh, i don't know what to say about that one okay so uh, Last issue, I think the last issue. Um, <laughs> let's get into the conflict of interest issue. Okay, so they 
seem like, from what you described, mm-hmm. they went through a very lengthy process to determine whether or not the people who were on these committees had conflicts of interest. Yes. And in fact, in the introduction, they talk about how the prior research raised, and I'm quoting, raised questions regarding adherence to guideline standards for trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when they published this paper, they declared their conflicts of interest. That's right. Which included how much meat they consumed. It is... One of the funniest tables I've seen in a paper in a long time. It's really interesting because yeah. they, they don't really, they, there's very little to this table <laughs> other than declaring how much meat they consume. Right. So the first, just as an example, the first voting panel member who is a methodologist, no financial conflicts, no intellectual conflicts, other relevant disclosures, consumes three to four servings of both red or processed meat per week. Mm-hmm. And they go through that for every every person on the panel. Yep. So then it emerges that the first author of this study had previously done one of these guideline recommendation type panels relating to uh, the health effects of sugar. Okay. And had, okay, I don't want to get this wrong because I don't want to misstate it, but, but had... Um, ties to the sugar industry. No, I don't know whether those ties are specifically receiving funding. Okay, so let me let me read to you the 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 New York Times article on this. It says Dr. Johnson also indicated on a disclosure form that he did not have any conflict of interest to report during the past three years, but as recently as 2016, he was the senior author on a similar study that tried to discredit. Uh, This is the New York Times opinion trying to discredit, but fine. International health guidelines advising people to eat less sugar. That study, which appeared in the annals as well, was paid for by the International Life Sciences Institute, a industry trade group largely supported by agribusiness, food and pharmaceutical companies whose members who have included McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, et cetera, et cetera, and the largest beef processor in North America. The industry group founded by a top Coca-Cola executive four decades ago has been long been accused by the World Health Organization and others of trying to undermine public health recommendations. Now, that was not disclosed in this particular study. That's and right. when that came out, that became a source of attack, both of the author, but also of the journal. Because the author technically did nothing wrong because the journal's conflict of interest guidelines say only only ask about the past three years. Mm -hmm. And so this person appropriately said I not received, although it's not totally clear whether there was actually support from this group that funded the from that's funded by the, the beef industry. Or not, I'm not totally clear on that. But the point is, that's the kind of thing that you disclose, even if it's not within the three-year window, just to be transparent. Because it's so related to the topic that they're looking at. Yes. And when you go to all the trouble to list how much beef you consume, but you don't mention that in the past, again, not I don't know that it was this study, but in the past you've been funded by this industry and you've done studies like this before that have been industry-funded guideline reviews, eh, that seems kind of relevant. Well, and, you know, in the paper, just the whole premise of this this study being based on, you know, more transparency. And, and in the introduction, they don't go as so far to, you know, point out anyone who or any prior authors who did not disclose potential conflicts, but they definitely insinuate that that could have happened. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so I mean, I I hear that, and I, I my mind then goes to okay, do I completely discard everything that's been said, or do I say okay, you can you can be funded by industry groups and still you can beef funded. <laughs> did, did I say that? Did I say beef funded? You, it is capable. One is capable of receiving funding. Is that better? Yes. From industry groups in the way that, you know, drug trials are done at universities often, but funded by by the, the drug companies themselves. Mm-hmm. And to still, you know, give a reasonable review of the evidence. 
but you have to give people the information they need. But it wasn't disclosed. Yeah, that's that's the unfortunate part. Because I do think if that was disclosed, like, would that? I mean, I'm not a huge fan anyway, I guess. But um, you know, I don't know that that would have completely changed my opinion of how. Would it for you? I think it if would. If it would have been I disclosed? I think it would. Um, and I say that. Well, they well, but they do say no panelists. But those were, th- was this particular author a panelist or an author? Because they uh, go through. Good question. Oh, so there's through, a difference is what you're saying. There is a difference. Okay. Because there were 13 panelists and they say that those panelists were not invited if they had any conflicts. That that, But they don't say the same about the authors. So these, the, the meat consumption disclosures in the appendix table are just for the panelists, not necessarily for panelist. all the authors. This was a panelist. A panelist. Yeah. Okay. So that panelist. is, that's worse. Yeah. Panelist and lead author. So I assume they would have been, I would have assumed they were panelists. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So, so I have grown increasingly skeptical of industry funding, not uh, the, the, the inability to remove the influences of industry funding. And I say that based on some bad experiences bad experiences, I'm putting in quotes there because they didn't happen to me, but things we've reviewed on this podcast around drugs for depression and non-disclosure of of information that led us as a group to look at some of the systematic reviews that divide up studies into whether or not they were industry funded and non-industry funded and the industry funded ones seem to find effects that the non-industry funded ones don't. And so I, I have grown increasingly skeptical of not that not that it makes it, you know, that there is like you gotta throw it all out, but that I take it all with a grain of salt. As soon as I find out there's industry funding, the bar you're gonna have to get over to convince me is higher. Yeah. And I, I think that's appropriate. And that's why we disclose so that people can can evaluate the study accordingly. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're going to leave it there. We skipped segment two because we had so much to say about that one. And I think that is totally fine. Maybe we'll come back to a kinder researcher culture another time. But let's get on to our amazing and amusing. You want to you want to lead? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, actually, no, no, wait, I take it back. I want to go first because mine actually follows on. <laughs> oh, it does? Okay, mine yes. is completely unrelated. No, no, so. mine is totally related. Okay. Which is um, mine for this time is the onion headline. I love I love the onion. You know that I am a University of Wisconsin grad where the onion I started. I, I know that it came from the University of Wisconsin, but I did not know that you were a University of Wisconsin. You're a badger. I'm a badger. Yep. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this was the onion headline that came out about this study. And the headline was, nutritionists report they wouldn't have to figure out which foods were bad for you if Americans would just eat normal for once. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Which I thought, you know, has some relevance to so many things in public health, but in particular nutrition. I thought Chris would have uh, would have signed on to that, co-signed on that one as well. What What do you got? Okay, so this is a study that I just came across. It, it was actually published as a news report in the newspaper, The Guardian, but the original study was published in a journal called Australian Mammo- Mammology. Oh, it's very. Yeah, yeah. That's usually, I usually read that one on the beach. Yeah. Yep. So it started out do, as a... Do you know that Nick was reading the same study? Wait, before I even mentioned... You didn't see this sitting here and you just were reading The Guardian and you came across this study? I, I wow. Thinking. And you found this and we converged you on the Nick, same topic. You and Nick have like the mind meld. That's crazy. Wow. Okay. Well, it is pretty interesting. So I'm going to present this as a bit of a mystery. Okay. So... Okay. I like mysteries. Over a 15-day period, researchers in the Kimberley region of Western Australia started observing a large number of toad carcasses. So over 15 days, they found 38 toad carcasses. And all of these toad carcasses are cane toads. I knew knew you were going to say cane toads. You did? I will come back to why. Yep. I knew you were going to say cane toads. So the really shocking thing, other than that just seeing that many dead cane toads is unusual, is that all of the carcasses had this incision in the chest that was of about the same size. So again, we're going to have to do millimeters. I'm sorry, because it's the Guardian, but about 10.8 millimeters vertically and 12.2 millimeters horizontally. This is very precise. Okay. So a little background on cane toads. They were first introduced into Australia and Queensland way back in the 1930s, but they've been moving 
You know why? I do. Okay, because they actually don't say this in the article, why they were first introduced. Oh, so it's it, this is, so the story of the cane toads is one of these um, so we're, fantastic stories of, of, of unintended consequences. Oh, yeah. Well, so they do mention that it's been devastating the native species and moving westward ever since they were introduced. And that's been that's been a huge problem. And a number of native species are now close to extinction because of the cane toad. They brought them in to eat the cane grubs, which turned out they didn't eat the cane grubs, but they ate everything else. What a mess. Yeah. Well, these researchers think that they may have found a solution to this problem. A solution to the whole the cane toad oh, the problem. Oh, the cane toad problem, period. So the little surgeons making incisions in these cane toads, it turns out, are it's the native water rat, also known as the Rakali, R-A-K-A-L-I. Am I saying that right? Wait a minute. The incisions are being made by an animal? Yep. A rat. A native water rat. So this animal is apparently highly intelligent. It has very sharp claws and teeth, and it can grow up to a kilogram. So it's pretty big. Awesome. So in all of these cane toads that had washed up on the riverbank, there was no evidence that they had like bite marks anywhere else on their body or on their heads. But it seems like the rats are holding the toads on their backs and then incising them in the chest to remove some of their organs. And it's even more specific than that. They remove the gallbladder because that's highly poisonous. So they excise the gallbladder and then they eat the heart because that isn't poisonous and is apparently super tasty. I did know they were poisonous, but I didn't know it was the gallbladder. Yeah. So the other crazy thing is that the biologists notice that all of the dead toads seem to be on the large end of the toad spectrum. And so they have since hypothesized that it's easier for them to do the, for the rats to do their surgery on the larger ones. Or maybe it's just, you know, if you're going to take the risk of tearing apart a poisonous toad, you're going to go for the big heart. And in some cases they, so the skin of the toads is also poisonous. So there are also examples where the skin of the thigh has been torn off and then the rats have eaten the thigh muscle, which is apparently, you know, it's a good, it's a, meaty muscle. Yeah. It's a good payoff. Absolutely. Um, so they're, they don't really know how the rats have figured out how to do this. It's possible that they have learned from other poisonous toads in the area. But one interesting thing about these rats is that they spend a whole lot of time with their young. So this particular biologist that they interviewed for this article thinks that maybe, you know, they're passing down this knowledge to the younger generation <laughs> Son, of rats. Time to teach you how to bite into a cane toad. <laughs> mm-hmm. I remember when my parents taught me. Yeah. Yeah. So now this particular biologist, um, whose name is Dr. Parrott, she is now really focused on water rat conservation. To get rid of the cane toads. To get rid of the cane toads. This could be the solution that they're looking Uh. for. But she notes that the rats are at risk of pollution from waterways. They're often caught in fishing lines. And they're also hunted by other animals like cats, foxes, and dogs. Which Um, are also not native to Australia. Probably not. Probably not. But I love her last quote. A story like this has really raised the Rakali's profile and made people not only realize that they are very clever, but they are a very beautiful animal we should be protecting. Oh, it's got a happy ending. Yeah, exactly. That is so cool because... First of all, it's just so cool. But second of all, so when I uh, graduated from my undergraduate days, one of my good friends bought me, gave me as a gift, the documentary. I don't remember the name of it, but it's there's a documentary that was probably made in the 80s, maybe, maybe early 90s, but I think it was the 80s, about the story of the cane toads that is absolutely hilarious and it's the story of how they brought the cane toads they then took over people hate them they you know try to drive over them they are poisonous some people smoke the or i I don't know how they ingest the poison and and they they have like trippy you know 
whatever's toad and, visions. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I guess you gain the intelligence of the toad. <laughs> I don't know how it works, and uh, it is so worthwhile. So go, go. Okay. You have to that go sounds look great. that up. Yeah. All right. And you can oh you can find it on YouTube Nick says and uh, so everyone go and watch the Kane Toad movie it is a delight well thank you for that so that is the end of our program if you've got any feedback on this or any other episode or you want to suggest a topic for us to take on you can tweet us at, at @pophealthyx or you can tweet me at, at @profmadfox or you could tweet Jen at at Jennifer, Jennifer R R Ryder <laughs> can we can we call you Jennifer R R R Ryder sure. Jennifer, that is a no. That is a definite, <laughs> definite no. I know how to read those signs. Jennifer R. Ryder. Or you can find us at the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. We want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound editing and this week for also finding the exact same story about cane toads and pointing us to the cane toad movie online. So thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you will download our next episode.